So good morning, everyone, and welcome to the third day of this workshop. Uh, today, we will focus on another very important topic, health and sustainability. The panel features renowned experts from diverse disciplines, uh, including medicine, mechanical engineering, and medical engineering. Uh, Dr. Hashanpur and Dr. Antau, the moderators, will now start the panel. Good morning, everyone. I have a couple of slides to uh, present uh, to you and uh, discuss how the panel is going to go ahead today. Okay, uh, good morning once again. Uh, for our agenda today, we have uh, from 11 to noon, uh, it'll be the panelists' presentations. We have five presentations today from our speakers, uh, who I'll introduce uh, in, in a short while. Uh, please uh, remember to ask a question, uh, use the chat function on Zoom, and please include the panelist's name to who you wish the question to be directed to. Um, we'll, uh, the, mod the other moderator, Fatima, uh, and I will collect the questions and uh, uh, we'll read them out to the panelists, either at the end of the session if we have time, or uh, later in the breakout session that we'll introduce uh, closer to the breakout session time. From 12 to one, we have a virtual networking and poster session. Uh, we request you to un uh, attend that and take a look at these uh, uh, great posters from some amazing students and uh, faculty across uh, the world. Uh, this will be through GatherTown and I believe you all have the link to that. And finally, from one to two, we'll have a breakout session. The first part of the breakout session of the first half is deals with the, a panel discussion. We have a few questions that we've posed to the panelists that take a look at challenges and future perspectives in these areas of health and sustainability and how the heat and uh, thermal and mass transport community can help. Uh, we've allocated about five minutes to move to the breakout sessions. And then from 1.35 PM onwards, we will have the breakout sessions where We'll build on the discussion, the panel discussion from 1 to 1.30, and we'll address any overflow questions. Um, we've, we've listed a stop time of 2 p.m. here, but we'll probably go on till about 2.15 p.m. if uh, there is interesting discussions going on. And uh, but feel free to leave whenever you need to uh, at that point. Uh, we'll introduce the speakers at the start of the session due to our tight schedule today. And we have six. Uh, amazing speakers here today. Uh, Dr. Esther Beltran, who's a chief scientist at the Florida Space Institute at the University of Central Florida. Dr. Cynthia Hibwell, who is the Oscar Wyatt Chair and Director of the Invent Lab at the J. Mike Walker 66 Department of Mechanical Engineering at Texas A&M University. Dr. John Leinhard, who's the Abdul Latif Jamil Professor of Water in the Department of Mechanical Engineering at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. Dr. Howard Stone, who's the Donald Dixon and Elizabeth Dixon Professor and Chair of Mechanical and Aerospace Engineering at Princeton University. Dr. John Bischoff, who's the Distinguished McKnight University Professor in the Department of Mechanical Engineering at the University of Minnesota. And Dr. Mehmet Tona, who's a Professor in the Center for Engineering in Medicine and Surgery at Mass General Hospital. Uh, with that, we'll go to our first speaker of today, who is Dr. Esther Beltran, followed by Dr. Cynthia Hepwell, Dr. John Leinhardt, uh, Dr. Howard Stone, and Dr. Drs. John Bischoff and Mehmet Tono, who will co-present uh, their work. I'll stop sharing my screen. I'm sorry. Uh, and uh, we'll go to Dr. Esther Beltran first. Do you see my screen here? Yes. Oh, okay. So I'm just going to put it on uh, display mode here. Uh, this I'm going to present this work from a NASA uh, project that we have going on at UCF. Uh, this is uh, from the Florida Space Institute, which is an institute hosted uh, uh, within UCF, University of Central Florida. But we, uh, we have different uh, our relationships, and I am the one that's leading for uh, the space, uh, human space exploration. 
So we we do have operational challenges when humans go to uh, to to this uh, different terrains, right? Which is uh, now the planetary surfaces. It's not just going to be on the free floating space station, although they have plans to go to what they are building a gateway. But um, the reason I'm putting this uh, picture here is because to show you the complexity of the uh, of the equipment and also what it would take to have these astronauts moving around these surfaces. And one of the challenges that we found, obviously, is that's the reason when I'm here, and I want to thank Dr. Uh, Pellas for inviting me, is the thermal regulation when these astronauts or these uh, humans are in this, uh, in this environment. Uh, humans, we produce heat. Uh, but in this case, uh, this new spacesuit uh, has had problems with uh, dissipation of heat and transfer of heat. But one, one of the reasons why we got awarded is because we were working on a radiation uh, protection and radiation mitigation. But we realized that then combination with uh, heat and heat transfer is one of the important aspects that we need to solve. And so within the mission that we have at Reveals, which is the team that I lead for human space exploration, uh, we have two types of radiation uh, most prominent for space, which are the solar spontaneous events, or SP SPEs, and then the other one is the galactic cosmic rays, or GCRs. The ones that we really worry about are the GCRs that are, have really high, high energy. They penetrate different materials and sub you know, surfaces. And then they can generate this secondary uh, bombardment. And, and that's why we have to be careful on which type of materials do we select and we pick uh, to make sure that they are uh, compliant and they don't create more damage. So now we look into what NASA is looking at and what we're going to the moon. And then, uh, and then from there, we go to Mars. That's the vision that NASA has at this time. The first focus that I have is for crew safety during uh, the surface operations. And now NASA has designated what would be the commercial crew program. They already have commercial crew program up in the space station doing the testing and uh, exploration and the testing that they will have to do uh, when they go to uh, the next mission, which is called Artemis mission. The Artemis mission is the sister of Apollo, and that's why they want to mention um, you know, that's why they got this name. But the goal is to go from the moon, test operations, and then also go to Mars. But what surface of the moon that designated is uh, now they made a consensus that we will be to the south pole of the moon, where we do have some certain areas that are preferred, which are the uh, permanent shadow regions of the, of the surface of the moon of the south pole. Apollo missions were on the equator side and they have different complexities. But the work that we do at FSI, which is the Florida Space Institute, is mostly extravehicular activity. And one of the reasons what I like about this is working with engineers. My training is I am a physician, a medical doctor, but I had to learn different disciplines. And through this workshop, I really learned a lot. And I, I thank, again, Dr. Pellis for um, inviting me. So what we want to do is create a consensus on what will be the, the mix, the ideal mix of materials or operations to make sure that humans are uh, safe and they don't cause any more um, problems. And so NASA created this uh, risk to path reduction for human space program or human HRP stands for human research program. This is an awful chart, but it's not my chart. <laughs> this is a chart that NASA has for uh, preliminary, actually prioritizing what will be the highest risk to the lowest risks. And this is still from 2018, and they have not upgraded this. The first risk and the most important risk they have is space radiation. But we need to combine that with how do we integrate the systems for the combination of what will be the life support systems, the equipment that they're going to wear, and also the instruments, not just the, uh, the equipment themselves, but how do we protect it, um, uh, all, all the tools that they're going to use. Going to the south pole of the moon and to the permanently shadow regions in, means there's a lot of uh, shade, right, obviously, because it's uh, 
the sunlight and the exposure to the to the moon is different uh, hours. So the moon day is different than the Earth day. They can set up base at a at a more luminant area of the moon. But if they want to do exploration, they will go to these areas. And then we worry about materials being brittle, and they would not. They will have to resist a lot of heat differential. And so we selected when we put this project together uh, it's different what NASA identifies as strategic knowledge gaps. And at that time. Uh, we identified these are the ones that we could do the best, which are the ones on the left side. And then we had to link with what will be the risk for human uh, human exploration. So my, my work was to make sure that engineers, physicists, chemists, we all combine efforts and uh, minimize the, the, the exposure of uh, radiation. That does not mean that we are not going to have radiation. We're just going to have radiation, but we want to minimize and the risk and create some strategies on how we do that. But the combination is that we have to create materials and shieldings and shielding um, surfaces that will be able to withstand those harsh environments. And so NASA set up this strategic plan uh, one thing that has happened since we have this new uh, election is that the deadline to go to the moon for human exploration to go to the moon, uh, it's not had been officially post uh, delayed a little bit, but it was set up to be to 2024, which wasn't sort of like a quite unrealistic deadline. Right now, probably NASA is reshaping. They have not made any announcements, but we do not expect to have humans in the moon on the surface of the moon, like they were saying by 2024. But here are the risks and the health risks of uh, space radiation, which affect all, all the systems, basically all the organs. But there are certain organs that are more important than others, right? So um, the problem that we have studying radiation is, is these humans are healthy. When they get selected to be astronauts, they're pretty healthy astronauts. They don't have any underlying diseases. And so how do we compare those to something that we can do here on Earth? And that is difficult because the ones that we have, uh, people that are exposed to radiation, most of them have some sort of underlying disease, uh, some sort of cancer, but then they take this other prophylactic or prophylactic radiation to palliate maybe um, metastases or things like that. But they do have physiology, uh, the, the physiology is different. Okay, thank you. So we had to do a, a risk assessment and, and divide which will be the, mis the most important risk that we have. Now radiation and thermal regulation and thermal transport are going into be the high impact and the high risk. And that's why we want to make sure that we create systems that mitigate and how do we control that. So I'm just going to go to the next stage. Uh, the people, my colleagues at, at Georgia Tech prepared these different types of graphite oxide um, polymers. These polymers have been uh, tested and then we add um, different uh, compositions to it. One of the compositions in the UCF, I'm sorry, uh, University Center of uh, University of California, Davis, they have been doing the, the mechanical testing, not so much the thermal testing. But what we do is we want to also use resources that are on the moon, and those are the regolith. Here are examples of what would be regolith that we take from what at UCF have an exolith lab. It is um, a combination of different terrain that is on the surface of the moon, the highlands, or the mare. And here we created um, a sort of like a, a block where we uh, tested this at the uh, Brookhaven National Lab in combination with an effort that we had with uh, Kennedy Space Center. And we blasted this with uh, uh, GCRs, the simulation that they offer, and then also SPE simulation. And you can see in this picture that is at the Brookhaven National Lab at the NSRL NASA uh, Research Radiation Lab. At the bottom left, that's uh, our block of, of regolith. So 
the team that I have, my colleagues at NutriDM, they're doing the radiolysis of each one of these components that are in this regolith and how they behave. But we have seen that there's this thermal uh, trapping or variation. Um, you are all experts in this. I am not an expert in, in heat or, or thermal transfer, but I am an expert on how to keep humans uh, safe and alive. But then this, these polymers are um, designed in a way to be lightweight. They had to be lightweight, flexible. They have to accommodate to the shape of the surfaces that we want to protect. And the one that I'm most interested in is obviously the highest risk of the, for humans, which is the head and then obviously uh, in the heart. Then we worry about all these other systems too. And on the left, you can see these polymers uh, that we use to protect the seeds that this uh, people at Kennedy Space Center uh, were testing. And the shape were not too long. It's, it's long, okay. So I'm just gonna uh, finish here. I just, uh, we have a lot of work to do, but I want to make sure that um, we're probably gonna have collaborations with Dr. Pellis students to look at the thermal. And I just want to acknowledge this, um, the funding through NASA. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Beltran. Uh, as we mentioned earlier, we are keeping questions till the end. We have Dr. Cynthia Hipwell next. And uh, please continue to add your questions to the chat. Thank you. Dr. Hipwell, you are muted. Thank you. <laughs> um, during the pandemic, remote work has been a godsend, but for people who work with remote, with touch and manipulation, such as in healthcare or caregiving, the lack of remote touch has definitely been a barrier. Um, that is what drives the importance of haptic technology where you can simulate, record, and display uh, touch remotely, um, such as in advanced human-machine interfaces where you can actually feel what you can see or hear, in teleoperation where you can actually feel and manipulate on both ends, for realistic prosthetics that have feeling to be able to uh, provide increased reality and dexterity, and for immersive virtual reality. We're actually working at the finger device interface in both the surface haptic devices and in both sides of the interface for teleoperation. The finger device interface is actually extremely complex. Uh, it, um, if we look at the surface haptic device interface where you actually have an electric field applied to be able to create the haptic effects. It acts as a parallel plates and the finger is attracted towards the device, changing the contact area, changing the friction and creating the illusion of textures and shapes on the screen. Uh, this has been thought to be just that simple parallel plates um, effect, but actually if you get down to the, the nanoscale, it's a much more complex interaction. We actually need to be considering the multi-scale nature of the topography on the finger and the screen, including things such as the fingerprint, the corneocyte level, and the nanotexture on the corneocyte. Um, this includes at the corneocyte level, um, that, that you actually have to be considering the differences in the texture between the ridge and the valley, and that these affect the contact mechanics, the contact resistance, and the formation of capillaries, which affect the performance of the interface. So we actually took this into consideration as well as the formation of capillaries due to adsorbed water from the changes in humidity in the environment, as well as the sweat in the interface. In doing this, we considered the nanoscale topography in the finger, as well as the screen. 
um, and looked at the capillary formation and what happened during application of the electric field. And looking at this, we actually were able to show that electro wetting, which is happening to those capillaries during the application of the electric field, creates as much of a force as the electrostatic force um, and is a big player in how this device works. The variation in the humidity and in sweat from person to person, however, then creates variation in the performance of the device. And so we wanted to look at, could you then design a device that was less sensitive, understanding the physics of the operation? So it went into a single asperity level and looked at the interaction between the electric field and the capillary um, and the dependence on the device uh, nanostructure and the device surface energy. Um, at this level, the electric field is actually diminished by the presence of the capillary. And so you have asperities that have a more electrostatic dominant effect and some that have a more electro wetting dominant effect. By actually designing the nanotexture and the surface energy of the device, we were able to create an effect that has a stronger electroadhesion effect through the electro wetting and able to reduce the sensitivity. This got us interested in the nanotexture effect on perception in general. And some of this just came from screens that came to us that have really different feeling. In fact, I wish you could feel them when we have remote touch, we will be able to do that in these type of presentations. Um, but we had these really different feeling glasses um, that actually, when we looked at them at the nanoscale, did not look very different, particularly when you consider this top 200 nanometers, which is where the skin interacts with the texture. They were very similar. And in fact, when we compared the contact area, they had almost essentially the same contact area. So the difference in feeling could not be counted um, from friction. But when you consider the capillary interaction and the extra force from capillary and the thermal aspect from capillary, now you're starting to see a, a different perception. And so at this point, we're looking at trying to relate the physics at the nanoscale to perception with a biometric system to be able to look at the human response. And by being able to engineer systems that are have dominant with different mechanisms, look at how we can relate perception to the physics of the interface. And this could allow us to make more predictive interfaces. People spend a lot of money designing the touch of services, but it's very empirical. We're also looking at how the electric field interacts with fluids such as sebum, which can actually cause contamination and preferential contamination in devices and using effects such as using temperature to change the modulus of that outer layer of the skin to be able to create the illusion of bumps without changing the effect of the thermal perception. Looking at more of the thermal side, if you're trying to make something feel realistic, the transient thermal behavior is actually a really important part of making it feel realistic. So think about if you go up and grab a door handle versus touching the door, they're both at the same temperature, but that door handle is going to feel cool. And that really comes from the difference in thermal diffusivity, which humans can actually detect changes the transient slip um, something slipping in their hand, the changes in the thermal properties. And so uh, Lynette Jones, who's worked a lot in these thermal haptics has shown that humans are primarily sensitive to this difference in thermal diffusivity. And so one of the potentials in the, the thermal community is we're working on active materials um, to change thermal conductivity. Could this be used for something like a multimodal haptic device where you want to be able to create a different effect for things such as metal versus an insulator? We have two minutes to wrap up. Okay, we could do this in other ways, but if you can do it in a way that doesn't affect the other modes, doesn't change contact area, that's going to be highly desirable. 
So you'd be looking for something with a high on-off ratio in kind of that mid going from moderately insulating to moderately conducting range. If you're working on materials like this, we would love to feel your materials. Um, other challenges in this space would be from the fact that you're trying to make things soft to interact with humans. So there are a lot of challenges then for soft electronics. Um, we expect these future devices to be skin integrated. And so there are a few things that would really be important in the thermal space. There's been a lot of work in John Rogers and others groups on, on the sensing side of the soft electronics, but there's still a pretty big gap in actuation. Um, so in trying to do soft actuation, there are definitely thermal mechanisms that people are considering. And so, but they're slow. And so if we can do things in the thermal community to be able to improve the response time through heat dissipation, local, local heating, nanostructuring to be able to get that faster response, that will be a big enabler in this space. And then of course we have the thermal management challenges that are similar to the thermal management challenges that have been discussed in the, I don't know if you call them hard electronic space, but with adding the fact that you've got this, the challenges, you've got the varying skin interface, you've got the need to keep the body at a relatively uh, tight range of temperature, the need for that breathability, and the fact that these soft materials aren't starting out to be inherently conductive. And so the materials space um, is an area where uh, we really could use innovation on the thermal side. And it looks like my time is up. So we'll talk about it more in the questions. Thank you very much, Dr. Hipwell. Uh, we have uh, Dr. John Leinhardt next. Thank you. I'm going to talk about uh, some problems around water and uh, food and climate. I'll talk mostly about uh, water and time permitting, I'll move on to the other two subjects. Um, just to say a couple of things briefly about work in my lab at present. We have been looking at uh, chemical free means of uh, membrane cleaning. You can see here we're causing an alginate layer to slough off of an RO membrane. We're doing this essentially with mechanical forces. Uh, in the middle frame, we've been looking at uh, switchable solvent water extraction, particularly we've been looking at the dimethyl ether water system. Uh, the concept here is to absorb water from a brine into the organic phase, the dimethyl ether. You are left with a concentrated brine that you discard, and then you separate the water from the dimethyl ether using either a temperature or pressure swing later. We believe we can hit water recovery in this technology around 40%. Uh, to do this, we've uh, had to spend a lot of time on the thermodynamics of the ternary mixtures. Uh, in particular, this frame shows the liquid-liquid uh, uh, equilibrium uh, line for the aqueous rich phase uh, in a water DME salt mixture. Uh, we're at this point able to do fairly good predictions and co correspondence with measurements. And the methods here involve essentially tools to predict the excess Gibbs energy of the mixture. In the third frame, we've been looking at uh, monovalent selective electrodialysis. In this case, we're using electrodialysis membranes that will pass monovalent ions, but will block divalent ions. The purpose of this is to tailor the water as you treat it. So if we start with groundwater that contains sodium and uh, chloride, we don't want those in an ultimate irrigation water because they're toxic to plants. And so we've been exploring uh, the appropriate uses of this, uh, particularly into the greenhouse agriculture space that being a, a multi-billion dollar industry. And then in the bottom frame down below, we've been looking at batch reverse osmosis. In this case, what we're doing is we're ramping the pressure up gradually behind the membrane so that they're not overpressurized the way they are in standard RO. And this has the potential to save a lot of energy. So in each of these areas, we've developed uh, various patents and several of these are moving on to commercialization. Now, for this uh, uh, workshop, I think it'd be most interesting to talk about what we can do to advance thermal desalination technologies, which have recently come to take something of a back seat relative to membrane-based uh, separations. So let me start with an example here. Uh, this is a multi-effect distillation system. 
the basic process brings uh, heat in uh, as steam. The steam enters the insides of these tubes in a falling film arrangement where you've got uh, seawater sprayed over the outside of the tubes. Heat from the steam causes uh, vapor to form and then that vapor is taken inside tubes in the next effect where as it condenses, it releases that heat to create more vapor at a lower pressure. That vapor then goes to the next effect. The next set of vapor goes to the next effect. What you see here then is that the heat is being reused over and over again. And we quantify that uh, performance with something called the gained output ratio. It's the mass of water produced times the latent heat, essentially the energy you would need to boil all that uh, purified water once, divided by the amount of heat you actually put in. And for this multi-effect system I'm showing here, uh, the gore is uh, between 9 and 12 in a typical system, meaning you're reusing that steam heat uh, about 10 times uh, in the course of the system. So this saves a lot of energy input relative to just sort of doing a once-off boiling process. Now, these systems uh, are typically designed, as I mentioned, with falling film evaporators. This is a shot from the inside of an MED system showing tubes after about two and a half years of operation. And of course, what you've got here is a lot of expensive metal, uh, a lot of surface area. And so this drives the capex of the system and it makes it more expensive. Uh, the other issue you can see here is that on the tubes, there's a little bit of scale formation. And in fact, about 1%, 0.1% of seawater is comp composed of uh, sparingly soluble salts, uh, calcium sulfate, calcium carbonate, strontium sulfate, and so forth. It doesn't take much to have these come out of solution. And this is actually a critical challenge for desalination of seawater and many other waters because these salts rapidly accumulate on heat transfer surfaces. They create maintenance problems and degrade performance. The solution to this typically uh, in MED systems is to cap the top temperature at about 70 degrees C uh, because you start to get inverse solubility of the salts at higher temperatures. Uh, some other technologies may be pushed to 110 C, but it's still very low. And what that means is that the steam energy you're bringing into the system is at low temperature, it's got low exergy, which means its ability to do the work of separating fresh water from salt water is limited. The other thing that scaling does to you is it limits the overall water recovery to about 50%. So this is central to the challenge. Now, in terms of dealing with the cost of tube materials, there's been recent work. This is by Heike Glade at the University of Bremen uh, from last year uh, at the IDA conference. They are looking at polypropylene graphite tubes as a potential replacement for metals. These things have a conductivity of about 15 watt per meter Kelvin. In some situations, you are in fact using steel tubing uh, to protect against corrosion uh, and, uh, and other problems. So these tubes are competitive on a thermal basis. Furthermore, they show a lower crystallization fouling tendency than steel tubes do. So materials advancements are one pathway. Another pathway is simply to rethink the technology. So this is membrane distillation. The concept is not to have a bunch of metal tubes, but to have a cheap polymer membrane that has pores in it. So if you have a heated saline feed to one side of the uh, membrane over here, and a meniscus forms, the membrane is hydrophobic, then vapor can travel through the pore and condense on the other side as fresh water. And so ideally, then you're recovering the heat of condensation in the opposite stream. Things you'd be concerned about here, of course, are fouling of the membrane and also the formation of thermal boundary layers on the feed side. Uh, within the literature, that's called temperature polarization, but they really do mean thermal boundary layers. It's a typical membrane. And then a typical configuration might be one such as shown over here, where uh, cold feed, say brine, is brought in it's top heated and then it's brought in contact with the membrane to the opposite side. Vapor travels through and condenses on the cold feed preheating it. So you've got a recuperative arrangement. Now this looks plainer, but in fact, that arrangement can be wound into a compact spiral so you get smaller equipment. And that's also very important. This technology has made remarkable strides in the last 10 years. And just earlier this year, Guillermo Zaragoza and his team in Spain reported a gore of 13 and a half for air gap membrane distillation. So it's, it's really moved nicely. Now, where does the steam come from? The other important idea here is that most of these systems are working as co-production. You'll have some type of a 
Rankine cycle power plant or a combined cycle power plant with steam turbines. Steam is extracted from these turbines and it's sent to these desalination units in the foreground. And so you're pulling out typically uh, low, low temperature, low pressure steam, maybe 120 C or so, and then you're using that to distill. Um, however, in systems like this, you also have a lot of incondensable gas. And to get rid of the incondensable gas, they're running steam ejectors, and those are often driven using uh, medium pressure steam, which is higher exergy. And that's an important consideration. Why does it matter? It matters because when you extract steam from the power plant, it results in a power loss. This is often presented as if the steam is just a waste product and the power plant is done with it. But the fact is the extractions are designed into the turbines. You could get more power out of that steam if you left it in the power plant. The result is that to meet a given power demand, you have to burn more fuel when you connect a desalination plant to it. And so that leads to the question, do you save energy with this method relative to using say an electrical method like reverse osmosis? This is some work that we did with Aqua Power uh, last year. Uh, this is the primary energy consumption of each of these desalination technologies. So the MED plant that I showed you lands over here. Uh, most of the primary energy is associated with steam. Some of it is also electrical work for circulating fluid, but this is reverse osmosis. It's purely electrical. And you can see that the primary energy requirements are lower. Uh, the plant that I was showing you in the previous figure was a multi-stage flash system. It actually consumes even more energy, both thermally and uh, in the electrical work. The gore of this plant is uh, about 12, but because it's pulling medium pressure steam, its energy exergy utilization is not so good. So this is a challenge for thermal distillation. If you want the thermal processes to compete with RO, you need to make the energy efficiency and the exergetic efficiency higher. So this plant has a gore of about 10, uh, nine or 10. And if you wanted to reach RO's energy consumption, you'd need that gore to approach something more like 20. And so that's the direction these technologies need to go. Mm -hmm. same, we have about a couple of minutes. Okay, thank you. At the same time, you have the problem of cost. Uh, if you're going to improve the thermal efficiency, we all know that you can make the heat exchanger bigger, you could use more stages, but that adds capex. And so you need solutions to make the distillation more efficient that don't raise the hardware costs, preferably that lower them. Uh, the same issue applies to solar distillation. There's been a lot of uh, funding flowing into the solar distillation area. In this case, you need high energy conversion efficiency in the desalination stage to limit the capital cost of the solar collectors. The solar energy may be free, but the collection of the solar energy is not free. And so if your system is inefficient, you need larger area, more solar power brought in. Uh, seawater reverse osmosis, if you like, is the competitor. Um, seawater reverse osmosis consumes 30 to 40 percent, uh, or energy accounts for 30 to 40 percent of the levelized cost of water, uh, all electrical input. But what's interesting about this is that if you were to go in and make the reverse osmosis stage reversible, Okay, so the reverse osmosis stage might account for 2.8 kilowatt hours per cubic meter. If you could hit the reversible limit of one kilowatt hour per cubic meter, leaving the rest of the plant the same, you would only cut the, the uh, cost of water about 20%. So the savings have to be found in other areas, materials, en engineering, modularization, financing, all of that contributes. So from my perspective, greatest thermal opportunities in distillation lie around going toward higher salinity feeds. RO has trouble with high salinity feed because the osmotic pressures exceed what the membranes are able to handle. Uh, and so we think about taking brines from RO and treating them by thermal means, getting additional water out. That remains an option. You want to do solute recovery if you can in the process of that, perhaps to precipitate valuable minerals from that and uh, make the process a little more economical. As an example of that, we have for ages produced magnesium metal from seawater. That's a very standard means of getting magnesium. You want to work with high fouling feeds, um, membranes again, a lot of equipment have difficulty with feeds that are fouling. Some students of mine and, uh, have founded a company that's working exactly in that area. Uh, they're using the humidification, dehumidification technology. Uh, to uh, treat uh, very high fouling waters, such as from textile wastes uh, and uh, oil and gas operations. They're in five countries now. 
You need low CapEx materials and you need system engineering. So my last slide, my last slide that I'll cover is this one. In terms of recovering minerals from uh, brines, there's a lot of interest, particularly in lithium these days because of the demand for lithium around EVs. And so a number of people have been working on technologies for pulling lithium out of uh, not just seawater, but oil and gas wastewater and other potentially valuable streams. So I think my time is up and I will stop here. I'm happy to talk about the other aspects in the breakouts. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Lehnhardt. Uh, uh, our next speaker is Dr. Howard Stone, and he's gonna be talking about something really relevant to, to the now. Can you see my screen? Yes, I believe so. Okay, thank you. Um, first, I wanna thank the organizers for the chance uh, to talk with you. Um, I'm gonna tell you a little about uh, what happens in the features of the pandemic we happen to be living in when you're uh, speaking. And, and this is a collaboration that's developed with a, a large group of people, including those from my group, uh, collaboration with, in France and a recent collaboration with researchers in India. To put the problem in perspective, I'm gonna just tell you a few things that you can read. Uh, you find the most astonishing thing about the pandemic was the complete mystery which surrounded it. Nobody seemed to know what the disease was, where it came from or how to stop it. And the disease may be transmissible before the patient himself is aware that he's attacked. Healthy persons often carry about in their persons the germs of disease thereby unconsciously acting as a continuing danger to themselves and a menace to others. If you are interested in transport, then you might uh, wish to note that this was written 100 years ago following the 1918 pandemic. And you could ask, what as a, a society, as scientists and engineers and public health officials have we uh, been able to gain in 100 years of research? And I think this just points out the great challenge of these kinds of problems. So I'm gonna tell you about some work that my group has done starting in March when I got very interested in this question about airborne spread of a virus. Of course, there's a lot of research in the literature. I'm happy to talk to you about what I know about it. And I'll just tell you a couple short stories. And the basic feature uh, is tied to transport or fluid mechanics. And what new uh, uh, insights might come both qualitatively and quantitatively if what you're asking about in terms of casual interactions with people uh, is concerned with the airborne spread of a virus. So we've done experiments, simulations, and models. Um, I'll show you uh, uh, in a few slides that we've looked at uh, numerical simulations of the Navier-Stokes equations inspired by speech to, to um, think about this question. You should know that in the literature, uh, there's wonderful work characterizing the number of droplets that are produced when you sing, talk, laugh, or whatever, and also that louder speech produces more droplets and the droplets, uh, which are sometimes called aerosols when they're sufficiently small, are the carriers of the virus. And I will point out that certain sounds you make, in particular uh, P sounds, those so-called plosive sounds, are actually producing uh, vortices, which are very effective in a very short time of transporting air in front of you, even though you can't see it. And I'll show you also um, a direct measurement of at least some of the uh, larger droplets that are produced every time you speak and open your lips if they're moist. And then you can ask uh, quantitative questions. And one we've asked is not just to ask about social distancing, but really uh, in include the idea of contact time. And we've been doing some work uh, on masks. And as you're probably aware, there's lots of work by others in this area. So already back in January, you could find uh, suggestions suggestions that the spread of the disease was associated with asymptomatic or pre-symptomatic people. In the transport literature, there's beautiful work going back to the 1930s at least on coughing and sneezing. And a lot of that work still continues, it's important. But in this virus, it was, very, uh, it was evident early on that it was the asymptomatic people, the casual interactions that might be leading to um, uh, spreading. I have two references on the slide, but there are lots of them. And so uh, I, with my colleagues, began to focus on this issue of speech because that was the feature of a casual interaction as we thought about it. 
And so I'm not gonna tell you about a room scale problem. I'm gonna tell you about the local interaction of people. And you should think about this anytime you're in any kind of engagement with others. Of course, now uh, we know that it's very important to wear masks, but there are gonna be times where you might be unmasked. And, and what I'm about to say uh, is sort of the local scale problem it ties into something, of course, you're probably reading about regularly, which is the crucial importance of another transport problem, which is uh, the ventilation problem. And I can comment a bit on that at the end. So we um, build on some work in literature. We use a green laser sheet and a Halloween fog to map flow fields in space. If you stand in front of a, a laser sheet and just speak, sing, or breathe, you can see little droplets on the screen. So you can also see what's produced as you do this. You can image all of this with a high-speed camera. And to give you an idea of the kinds of work we do, when you uh, breathe or speak, the Reynolds number is in the range of 1,000 to 10,000. So um, uh, on the slide, you can see a speaker on the right, uh, and he's uh, speaking into a, a fog illuminated with a laser. He says, sing a song of six pence. The pence is a plosive, and it rapidly propagates and carries all the other where with it in front of you, we can do a, a version of PIV called correlation image velocimetry to um, understand these flows. And ge generically, for many phrases, in particular, those common phrases that will have plosive-like sounds, you get a conical jet that's formed in front of you. Of course, we don't recognize it because we don't see the air. But if you image it, you're easily disturbing the air in front of you out a couple meters, as I'll now show you. This work was then the input to numerical simulations. We took advantage of the fact that in the speech literature you could find already back four or five decades, measurements of flow rates versus time uh, during speech. We digitized that and then repeated it over and over again as shown in the upper right. We then used that in a numerical simulation that sort of mimicked the size of a mouth in a human head and then uh, used the initial conditions from uh, the kinds of experiments we do to uh, study the, the flows that are created here, they're uh, color coded by time. And again, you can see you form a, effectively a conical jet and that conical jet, I'm sorry, that conical jet has all the features we see in the experiment, even though it's a kind of crude numerical simulation without all the fine details that you have in a, in a real speaking experiment. Because of that, we can then make an analytical model that tells you how far does a uh, speech uh, propagate as a function of time. That's the formula shown here, where alpha is the cone angle. It's universally the half cone angle is about 10 degrees, as is known in the fluid mechanics literature for steady turbulent jets. V0 is the typical speed that you breathe, speak, sing, or talk with. And A is the typical opening of the mouth. You can compare this formula with uh, numerical simulations. Numerical simulations of what's called um, a starting jet, just flow out of an orifice is the orange line. It's a square root of time. A cough is like an individual puff. It goes as the one quarter time. What we see with repeated sentences is a repeated sentence at short times looks like flow from an orifice. And it does so at long times because it looks like a quasi steady jet. We can compare that with experiments. Perfect. We can compare that with experiments where we plot length versus time. And uh, our analytical description follows the data pretty well. You can imagine there's some scatter depending on what you say. And I just want you to point out that in 30 seconds of speaking, the distance you go is easily greater than two meters. And so you might wonder about the one meter World Health Organization social distancing uh, statement or the two meter six foot uh, CDC statement. We turned a high speed camera on our lips when we speak and we were able to understand a little how wet lips form filaments, which are stretched by flows and form droplets. Uh, we, we, we can capture the instant of lip opening to see the uh, spray of droplets that are produced. And we were able to think then because it's from wet lips, we remarked that if you stop wetting, uh, we heard one of the speakers already talk about wetting, which you, you can stop wetting by putting a lip balm on your lips. And that at least for a short time mitigates production of droplets when you speak. So with that, um, I'll just say we've done some other work, including uh, working with musicians and the Fleur Company to image uh, CO2 as you, as you uh, speak to get a better understanding of what you're doing. And if you want to think about how tra the transport community can play a role here, I have a, a list here of a number of things that I'm happy to talk about. 
and talk with you about in the in the uh, settings afterwards. But I included uh, the idea of communication because maybe visualizing what happens in these situations, whether it's for humans, animals, or plants uh, involved in virus transmission, might help more people understand the challenge we have in the face of an airborne virus. Uh, and I'll stop. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Stone. Uh, and uh, final speakers uh, for the panel session today, uh, Drs. John Bischoff and Mehmet Tona, who will be co-presenting their work. Can you see my screen all right? Yes. Great. Thank you very much for the invitation to tell you about our new Gen 4 uh, NSF ERC advanced technologies for the preservation of biological systems and uh, to present it in your new frontiers workshop. I'll be presenting on behalf of both myself and my deputy director, Mehmet Toner. This is uh, with the University of Minnesota, Cal Berkeley, MGH, uh, UC Riverside and also uh, one member at Carnegie Mellon. So what we're really trying to do is realize through cryopreservation and biopreservation various societal benefits, whether it's cell therapies, transplantable organs, having tissues off the shelf so we can reduce the costs of drug discovery, uh, being able to bank transgenic lines uh, from different vertebrate models or aquatic species, also being able to bank whole ecosystems such as coral reefs and to basically inspire a fauna bank, something like Svalbard that exists for seeds, being able to feed the world sustainably through cryo seed, which is uh, embryos from aquatic species, banking skin and other bio dressings for mass casualty events, such as what happened uh, in the volcano uh, catastrophe in New Zealand, and also studying trauma for eventual battlefield injury stabilization and even space travel. So these are the societal benefits that our new ERC are seeking to uh, impact and bring about. And really what biopreservation is, uh, in this case, we're really looking at it from the point of view of uh, uh, it being a supply chain management issue. So if you look in the green boxes, the isolation culture, tissue engineering and genetic engineering of all these systems, whether aquatic species, mammalian vertebrate systems, or, or even human systems on the left, those green boxes have been well studied. Uh, and the blue boxes on the far right are really those societal benefits that we're hoping to achieve. And so uh, what is lacking and that we hope to achieve in our tenure five-year renewable to 10-year, hopefully, ERC are these uh, boxes in orange-red, which really have to do with storage, transportation, shipment, and banking of these important biological systems. So what we're really focused on are uh, approaches and technologies that work at different temperatures that extend the time period on the x-axis for storage and as we reduce the temperature, we're really uh, bringing about metabolic suppression in these biological systems. So you see several examples on the left. Hypothermia is what's used today on organ systems and really only gives us hours for an organ. Uh, the MGH group is uh, really focusing on both supercooling and partial freezing, which are nature-inspired approaches that can extend that to days and even weeks. And then finally, there are groups at uh, the other institutions and primarily also at Minnesota, where we're focused on going to the glassy state or the vitrified state in order to potentially get years of, of storage. And the engineering aspect of this that's related to our field is really the control of temperature, pressure, and concentration in order to achieve these different uh, preserved states for suspended animation. So we have these research thrusts in green in the middle, which I'm gonna tell you a little bit about in terms of preparing our biological systems for this type of preservation, um, which is really biological engineering. Then our second thrust is really multi-scale thermodynamics of water, really focused on phase change between 
being totally uh, in the solid phase versus partially high sub-zero and low sub-zero uh, temperatures. And then finally, rapid and uniform warming to come back from these uh, preserved states. And what you see on the upper uh, blue are the test beds, which are non-traditional test beds. And these test beds are each of them really leading to distinct markets. So in the case of cells, this really is related to cell therapies. Uh, microphysiological systems are in the regenerative medicine field and also very interesting to biopharma for drug development. Whole organs, of course, for transplantation and then whole organisms uh, and zebrafish is our uh, favored test bed in the organism phase where we'll be uh, thinking of aquaculture and also preservation of aquatic systems. It should be noted that all of these test beds are supported with a variety of sensors and metrics that allow us to understand uh, whether the test bed has successfully reached the preserved state and whether it's returned from it. So the first thrust area in biological engineering, we're really looking at <clears throat> major challenges uh, from the molecular all the way through tissues and organs. Uh, at the molecular level, we're trying to optimally engineer non-toxic cryoprotective agents. So we're trying to get away from dimethyl sulfoxide, which is a traditional CPA, but it's a neurotoxin. We're trying to do that with non-metabolizable sugars, ice inhibitors, and other CPAs. Uh, at the genetic and cellular level, uh, membrane permeable permeabilization in order to have those cryoprotective agents taken up by cells and into tissues, uh, and then at the tissue and organ level to have uniform delivery and, and removal of the cryoprotective agents. And there are a number of barriers there that we can get into and discuss uh, in Q&A. So at the molecular and cellular approach, uh, we, we are using genetic engineering to modify the cryoprotective agents or modify the membranes of cells to take up the cryoprotective agents. We're learning from nature. So we have biomimetics that uh, we are using for ice inhibition, for instance, or to slow or control the cryoprotective agent delivery. Uh, then we're also using metabolic control uh, in order to uh, deliver and, and use different types of CPAs in, in liver, for instance. We're also at the tissue and organ level using, again, inspirations from nature, uh, from the wood frog that can survive with 65% of its water in the frozen state for weeks, if not months, and the Arctic ground squirrel. Uh, and we're using metabolic engineering and multithermic machine perfusion in order to reach uh, these states of biological uh, pr preparedness. In the case of thrust area two, where we're trying to go into um, essentially reaching the, the preserved state, we're using thermodynamics of water or understanding that to achieve it. And the challenge is there. We're trying to reduce temperature and metabolic rate. We do this by uh, either reaching an ice-free supercooled state in large volumes or a partially frozen or an isochoric cooling approach to even lower temperatures that might be below minus 20. Or finally, we wanna to get to a vitrified glassy state that could be below minus 120 or below essentially the glass, uh, uh, the glass temperature for the CPA water mixture. And the barriers, again, we can talk about in Q&A. Here are some examples controlling thermodynamics of water to stabilize organs from the MGH group. Uh, and uh, there have been several breakthroughs in supercooling where rodent livers can survive out several days. We have a human organ now that can go over a day uh, we are also stabilizing uh, in a supercooled state smaller systems and trying to work to partial freezing for whole uh, whole organs. This will extend shelf life, and this would allow you know sharing of organs to change the way it's uh, being used in the United States, maybe even allowing international organ sharing. And isochoric cooling is a new approach that's being uh, pioneered by uh, Boris Rubinsky's group at Berkeley, where they control. Uh, they uh, essentially lock the volume, and this uh, does not allow the system to completely change phase. And this is giving us uh, advantages in a number of different cell, organ, and food systems. Finally, for the third uh, aim, which is um, electromagnetic rewarming, what we're trying to do is basically come back from these cryogenic states in a fast and uniform way. 
And this requires us to uh, control both the cryoprotective agent delivery and also the, the, the warming rates. The lower the amount of CPA we have in the system, the faster we need to travel to move from uh, into the glassy state as well as back from the glassy state, for instance. And so we can do that with plasmonically active nano, uh, nanoparticles in small droplet systems. We can also use radio frequency activated metal forms in tissue systems, microphysiological systems, and we can use uh, uh, radio frequency fields with high performance magnetic nanoparticles to bring back even whole organs, uh, even human scale organs. And so okay, we're two working. Minutes, Dr. Bishop. Thank you. Uh, we're working to uh, scale all of these systems up. Here are a couple of quick examples. In droplet systems, we've worked on mammalian cells for cell therapies, coral larvae with the Smithsonian, white shrimp for aquaculture, and zebrafish were the first group to bring a zebrafish embryo back, have it uh, grow and spawn normally. Uh, we're also working with nanomaterials and electromagnetic fields for nano warming. This would be the scalable technology that could be used on something all the way up to a human organ. And this requires us to uh, work with many groups that are uh, creating high performance magnetic nanoparticles that can heat in radio frequency fields and also be colloidally stable in these high concentration cryoprotective systems. So in summary, uh, this is a really uh, exciting opening area. Uh, there's a variety of uh, different multidisciplinary uh, fields that intersect to hopefully bring about our goals for ATB Bio. I'm happy to discuss any of this in the uh, Q&A. Thank you very much.